warmest greetings to all within the sound of my voice today. My name is Norris Wilson and I am the minister of Drumbolg Reform Presbyterian Church just outside Tamlet O'Crilly in Mid-Ulster. As the members of Drumbolg gather together to tune into this service of worship in their homes, we invite you, wherever you are, to come and join with us. The call to worship is Psalm 95, verses 1 to 7. O come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before him with thanksgiving and shout joyfully with psalms. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the flock under his care. Our opening psalm of praise expresses what it means to belong to the Lord's flock. The psalm needs little introduction. It's the well-known, well-loved words of the 23rd psalm, this time in what we call the A version. Our singing is led by the Northern Presbytery Choir, so please join in singing with them Psalm 23, the A version, to the tune Resignation. You can find the words of the psalm in the description below. Let us praise God. pray. O God, our loving Heavenly Father, we come to you today through that one who said, I am the Good Shepherd. The Good Shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Who said, I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. I call them by name, and they follow me. I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them from my arms. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for Jesus, your Son, our Saviour, the Good Shepherd. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the provision you have made through Christ. We thank you for the green pastures and the still waters. We thank you for the way that you give rest and restoration to our souls. We give thanks for your leading and guidance. Especially we thank you that on this day 
of crisis, when so many are being called away suddenly, that for all who can say, the Lord is my shepherd, they can also say, yea, though I walk through the dark valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you're with me. Your rod and staff comfort me. We thank you, Lord, that death for the believer is but the curtain that leads to the Father's house, to the table spread, to the anointing with the oil of joy and welcome, to the overflowing cup waiting there in the Father's house for all who will press on in the faith. Lord, on this day when we gather, our hearts are solemnized by what is happening in our not only in our society, but in our world. So, Lord, still our hearts in your presence. Let that peace that Jesus gives descend upon us. Speak to all our hearts. Comfort us, teach us, challenge us, and send us on our way rejoicing. For only Christ can give that joy that the world cannot give and that the world cannot take away. Hear us, Lord, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, I want to speak to the boys and girls. I want to speak to you about coronavirus. Right from the start, I was struck by the name of this virus. Coronavirus. I wondered what it meant. I could faintly remember it from a song by Simon and Garfunkel, but it was the first time to hear about coronavirus. And then on Thursday evening, in a programme by Panorama about coronavirus, the speaker explained that corona means a crown or crowns. Our word coronation comes from that word corona. Coronation is when a king or queen is crowned. Also, the, the cup shape at the centre of a daffodil is called its corona or its crown. We notice particularly the daffodils at Easter because they remind us of Christ's crown and his victory over sin and death. And when you look uh, at the coronavirus through a microscope, of course, you can see that it has various heads and what looks like a number of little crowns on those heads. But as we watched what happened, we saw the, the virus attacking, uh, attacking a person's good cells and getting in and doing great damage to that cell even killing it. And so it moved on then to the next cell. It was almost as though a group of crowned princes were invading territory not their own and doing much damage. And so that means that the scientists are working flat out on how to stop the ongoing march of that army with the crowns pray that the scientists will soon succeed in getting a cure for this virus. But what I want to say especially is that there is one who has succeeded and won the victory over an even more terrible virus and that's the virus of sin that threatens to kill and destroy us. And the one who has succeeded in winning the victory is Jesus. In the book of Revelation, chapter 19, John pictures Jesus riding on a white horse, commanding his troops, attacking and defeating the rebellious nations. And we're, we're told his name is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And what else do we learn about him? Note this very carefully. On his head are many crowns. 
Mini Carona. Jesus is the true crowned ruler. He will help the scientists to defeat that vicious enemy, coronavirus. We need to keep on being patient and trusting and praying and we will win with Christ's help in the end. Our script reading today is Psalm 13. Psalm 13, a psalm of David. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Look on me and answer, O Lord, my God. Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. My enemy will say I have overcome him, and my foes will rejoice when I fall. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. Amen. May God add his blessing to the reading of his precious word. We come now to the message from God's word. Will you turn with me to Psalm 13? Already in this brief series, we've thought about, first of all, finding God's purpose in the pandemic. Secondly, trusting God's promises in the pandemic. Today, our subject is pleading for God's presence in the pandemic. As we look at this psalm, it seems as though David has caught the virus, as we say. One commentator rightly puts it, This psalm is a cry to the Lord for, de for deliverance from a serious illness that threatens David's life. It is a cry of anguish concerning a prolonged and serious illness. As he says in verse 3, Give light to my eyes, or I will sleep in death. It's wearing David down. He doesn't know how much longer he can go on. What I plan to do, very simply, is divide the psalm into its three constituent parts and apply it to our situation today. So we look, first of all, at the sadness of the situation, verses 1 and 2. Secondly, we will look at the seriousness of the situation, verses 3 and 4. And then thirdly, we will look at the Saviour in the situation, verses 5 and 6. So first of all, we consider the sadness of the situation. We see this in verses 1 and 2. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I wrestle with my thoughts and every day have sorrow in my heart? How long will my enemy triumph over me? Notice how often he cries out, how long? One of my roles here is chaplain of the BB company. And every so often we take the boys of the company for an outing. I remember one some years ago when we took the boys by car to the ice bowl in Dundonald. I had four boys in my car and boy were they excited. We set off in a cavalcade. I had just got through in this rush and was approaching Claddy when one of the boys in the back leaned forward and asked, How long before we get there? We were on the other side of Port Lanone when he piped up again, Are we nearly there yet? Halfway to Randallstown, it was the same urgent request. 
How long now? As we headed down the M2. How long now? So it seemed it was every five minutes until finally I said, look, if you could just sit there quietly for half an hour, we'll be there. So eventually we got to Dundonald. He broke the silence. How long now? Just five minutes, I said, with a great measure of relief. And thankfully, he slept most of the way home. How long? It's hard for us to wait. It's hard for us to bear with things, or thole, as we say. And so, to be serious now, so it was for David in Psalm 13. Four times he pleads, Lord, how long? Now remember, this is a believer speaking. And so it is with believers today. I don't have to remind you of our circumstances. The shadow of a virus which seems so malevolent in its relentless attack. Its shadow hangs over us and we cry out to God. How long? But notice how David goes on to speak very poignantly and painfully about what he's going through. Look at it with me. Verse 1. How long, O Lord, will you forget me? Will it be forever? Yes, he feels God has forgotten him or is just ignoring him. It's as though God is saying, should I know you? Have we met somewhere before? Sorry, I don't remember you. But David goes further. How long will you hide your face from me? As one commentator says, the sense of a friendship that has clouded over is hauntingly expressed. It's as though I seek to draw near to God, he says in verse 1, but he just turns away. He hides his face. And so David gives vent to his feeling of desolation. It's as though he's saying, but Lord, I thought you loved me. Now it seems you don't after all. We see just how far down a believer can go. Is it any wonder he goes on to say in the first part of verse 2, How long must I wrestle with my thoughts? Obviously his mind is in turmoil. He knows he shouldn't think those thoughts about God. And he tries to think good thoughts. But it's a wrestling match. And it's grievous to him. He says, how long must I have sorrow in my heart every day? As we reflect on our situation, we ask how many hearts are grieving today? Not only in our province, not only in our nation, but throughout the whole world. The sheer, utter sadness of our situation. That's the first point for us today. As the commentator says, David moves from the dull ache of dejection to the mental turmoil of desolation. But his complaint isn't finished. How long will my enemy Triumph over me, he asks. Who is the enemy referred to? Could this not be a reference to his severe illness, which is leaving him utterly without strength and therefore is threatening his ability to reign? Or could it not be death itself, the great enemy? As verse 3 seems to be saying, if so, then it seems that like our Prime Minister Boris, David is in intensive care. 
like so many today, and we cry out with them, how long we feel the sadness of the situation. Secondly, David speaks of the seriousness of the situation. As we move into the second section, the situation seems to have worsened. David pleads, look on me, turn your face to me, answer me, give light to my eyes. His very sight is failing. Give light to my eyes or else I am going to die. As we say in Northern Ireland, David was, quote, near himself. He senses that the weaker he gets, the more death is moving in. He can only pray and hope and trust. There are two things about his prayer that I want to underline. First of all, notice the person he addresses. David reminds himself that God is more than the creator. He's also the covenant Lord. And the word Lord is in four capital letters. For the second time, he uses that covenant name, Lord, with the capitals. And he adds to it the crucial personal element, O Lord, my God. Lord with the capital letters is the name of the one who has entered into covenant relationship with his people. And as such, he has bound himself to his people by his sovereign promises. Parents, you will know what it's like if your children say to you, maybe on a Saturday morning, Dad, will you take us to the swimming pool today? Dad says, well, I'm busy just at the moment. But then they say, but Dad, you promised. Now that's a different matter entirely, isn't it? You can't break a promise. And so David, in effect, says, Lord, you promised. And I know that you're still the covenant-keeping Lord. You will keep your promises. That's the person he addresses, whom he refers to as my God. But notice, secondly, the plea that he makes. Notice what he says in verse 4. My enemy will say, I have overcome him. And my foes will rejoice when I fall. In effect, he says, Lord, what about your honour? The enemy will say, God is not so powerful after all. He let David die. And then all my other foes will join in. They will be rejoicing and jeering when I am brought down. Brought down to death. So David is making a bold and an urgent plea. He is saying, Lord, your honour is at stake here. And above all else, David wants God to be honoured, even in what is happening to him. Paul in the New Testament was like that, as he writes to the Philippians in chapter 1 and verses 20 and 21. There Paul says, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage, so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. So we see the seriousness of the situation but then thirdly and finally, we come to the Saviour in the situation. Verses 5 and 6. But I trust in your unfailing love. My heart rejoices in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. How wonderful it is that a psalm that begins in the very depths of despair ends on the heights 
of praise. How does that come about? Look with me briefly at three things in closing. First of all, David reminds himself of his commitment to the Lord in the past. We see that in verse 5. I trust in your unfailing love. Please note the emphasis that there is in this statement. Literally it goes, But as for me, I have trusted in your unfailing love. Many years before, David, the shepherd boy, had come to trust in the good shepherd. And in spite of many ups and downs, he was still trusting. Yes, even though that faith has been shaken to its very roots and foundations. Notice how he talks to himself. But as for me, he says, so with us today, if you are a believer, then keep trusting and do like David, talk to yourself. Remind yourself God is in control. God does have plans and purposes to achieve in this current pandemic. God will be glorified in and through it all. Notice that term, unfailing love. This is a very rich expression. It's difficult to just use one word in translation because it means covenant love, steadfast love, loving kindness, tender mercy. So with all of that to know and to experience, why not trust? And if you're trusting in Christ today, I say to you with David, keep trusting. So first of all, David reminds himself of his commitment to the Lord in the past. But then secondly, we see how David rejoices in God's salvation in the present. My heart rejoices in your salvation. My heart rejoices in your salvation. From a heart that was threatening to give up physically to a heart that rejoices spiritually. And he is rejoicing, as he tells us, in God's salvation. In other words, God is responsible for it all. He provided that salvation through his son who died on the cross in the place of his people, bearing their punishment. He was buried, but he rose again. He ascended to the throne of the nations. He sent the Holy Spirit in fullness. He is coming back. He is coming this time in power and in great glory. Rejoice. We are on the victory side. Thirdly and finally, David resolves to praise God in the future. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. Notice that summation of the hard time he has just been through. How will he describe it? Will he speak of how terrible it was? No, he says, the Lord was good to me. He did more than I asked. He exceeded my expectations. So what else can I do but sing my praise to him? Praise him with all my heart and soul. The Lord has been good to me. And so David has come full circle. From threatening pestilence to thankful praise. With God's help, we too can make that journey. Romans 8 verse 28 reminds us that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. So we must keep trusting, 
Keep rejoicing. Keep singing. Keep reminding yourself of the great and precious promises. Keep praising. Keep counting your blessings. Lord, how long? Soon, my child. Soon. And better than it's ever been. This is our God. He is our refuge. May we trust in him today and know his blessing. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord, our loving Heavenly Father, we bow before you in prayer on this Sabbath day. We thank you, Lord, for the return of the Sabbath day, for the opportunity it gives us to come together around your word. We thank you, Lord, that you call us to acknowledge you, to worship you, and we do so, O Lord. We thank you that you are a spirit infinite, eternal and unchangeable in your being, in your wisdom, in your holiness, in your justice and in your truth. And so, Lord, we are your creatures and we are made to glorify you and enjoy you forever. So we, we bow humbly, O Lord, before you. We come thanking you for Jesus we thank you that on every Lord's Day we remember and celebrate his triumph over sin and death and the grave, his glorious resurrection. We thank you, Lord, also for his ascension, for his session, for his sitting down at the right hand of the majesty on high, for his pouring out of the fullness of the Spirit. And for that promise that he is coming again. Lord, as we gather, we come to you in his name. And we come, Lord, aware that we are meeting in times of great stress, in times of great trouble. But yet we thank you that already today you have assured us that Christ is with us in the midst of this experience. We pray that those who feel like David, who feel forgotten, we pray that you would speak to them afresh and renew their love and renew their trust in you. We thank you for David's experience, how he could say, I will trust in your unfailing love. My heart will rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, for he has been good to me. Lord, you have been good to us. You've been good to our nation, and yet, Lord, our nation has turned away from you. We believe, Lord, that you are calling us today, calling us very clearly, calling us to come back to you, calling us, Lord, to think again about your word and what it would call us to do in terms of how we live our lives day by day. So, Lord, our plea is with the psalmist that you would show us your unfailing love, and restore us again, O Lord, our Saviour. We pray particularly, Lord, today for the whole situation in our, in our nation. We bring to you, Lord, the practical needs. We think especially of all those doctors and nurses for the cost, O Lord, in human terms of their commitment to you and to their work. They're working under very difficult and threatening conditions. And so we pray that Psalm 121 would be their portion, that you would keep them safe, O oh Lord, from the virus. We think of so many families and people restricted in terms of their movements. We pray especially for children not able to be at school, we pray that you would grant special patience and long-suffering uh, in our homes, Lord, in these days. We pray for those who uh, have shops, that you would uh, help with the food supply. We think then, Lord, of 
ministers of the gospel and the opportunities we have in these days to uh, preach the gospel over the airwaves and we pray that your word will come bringing peace to the fearful and assurance of protection to the vulnerable will come with comfort to those who have lost loved ones but above all Lord we pray that you would speak in that way that can raise the spiritually dead and bring them to new life and bring them to faith and we pray Lord that through all of this great disaster that's spreading all throughout our world that you would sweep many Lord into your kingdom in these days so Heavenly Father we pray for your blessing upon the preaching of the word we thank you that we hear accounts of people who are witnessing nurses in hospitals and among doctors who have heard of people turning to you with a new hunger and a desire to know your word Oh Lord, we thank you that you always work for the good of those who love you in all things, even in the hard things of life. We think of David who suffered so much in the early part of that psalm, who cried out to you, Lord, how long must this go on? We thank you that he was able to be reassured as he was reminded that you, Lord, are in control, that your love does reach out to people and that you do Love your people with a genuine, everlasting love. We remember of old in the days of, of Isaiah, when your people felt that like David in this psalm, Psalm 13, that they were forgotten. We remember that word that came, can a woman forget? The child that she has born and show no compassion? Yes, she may. But you said, but I will never forget you. For I have graven you on the palms of my hands. You are mine. You will always be mine. I will always love you. So Lord, assure us of that love in these days. Comfort your people. Draw near to us each one, Lord, from the youngest to the oldest. On this special day, we thank you for Christ's victory and we look to Christ to be the answer to our need. May he come in great power among us in these days. Father, we each one are called to look within. We pray that you would forgive our sins. We pray that you would lead us in your ways. We pray that our love for you would grow more and more as the days pass. So, Lord, work out your plans and purposes for good through this pandemic. It's not out of your control. We look to you, Father, for the coming days. Hear us in our prayers. Forgive our sins, Lord, and accept us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our closing praise is Psalm 121a, singing the whole psalm. It's the Scottish medical version to the tune Abbeville. Here the psalmist asks a very important question. He is in Jerusalem looking around at the hills which often were filled with threats from robbers and bandits and he must travel there. Who will keep him safe? We live in a very dangerous world and so we ask the question, who is going to protect us from the coronavirus we need to be kept, we need to be protected, we need to know that someone is looking after us. And the answer, of course, is the Lord. He is so concerned for his people that he watches over them. He never slumbers nor sleeps. He is always on guard. And we read there that he will keep us from evil and he will keep our souls, our souls that are committed to him. He will keep us safe. We can trust and not be afraid. This is the message of this psalm. As we come to sing, you can find the words of the psalm in the description below. Let us praise God. I
and Savior, Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, be with us all. Amen. <music>